to Maccabees 1 The brethren, the Jews that be at Jerusalem and in the land of Judea, which wish unto the brethren, the Jews that are with throughout Egypt, health and peace, God be gracious unto you, and remember his covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, his faithful servants. I gave you all an heart to serve him and to do his will with a good courage and a willing mind, and open your hearts in his law and commandments and send you peace, and hear your prayers and be at one with you, and never forsake you in time of trouble. And now be here praying for you. What time as Demetrius reigned in the hundred three score and ninth year, we the Jews wrote unto you in the extremity of trouble that came upon us in those years, from the time that Jason and his company revolted from the Holy Land and Kingdom, and burned the porch and shed innocent blood. Then we prayed unto the Lord and were heard. We offered also sacrifices and fine flour, and lighted the lamps, and set forth the loaves. And now see that ye keep the feast of tabernacles in the Mount Caslew. In the hundred fourscore and eight year, the people that were at Jerusalem and in Judea, and the council and Judas, sent greeting and health unto Aristobulus, the king Ptolemy's master, who was of the stock of the anointed priests, and to the Jews that were in Egypt. Insomuch as God had delivered us from great perils, we thank him highly as having been in battle against a king. For he cast them out that fought within the holy city. For when the leader was come into Persia and the army with him that seemed invincible, they were slain in the temple of Nanya by the deceit of Nanya's priest. For Antiochus, as though he would marry her, came into the place and his friends that were with him to receive money in name of a dowry, which when the priest of Nanya had set forth, and he was entered with a small company to the compass of the temple, they shut the temple as soon as Antiochus was come in, and opening a privy door of the roof, they threw stones like thunderbolts, and struck down the captain, hewed them in pieces, smote off their heads, and cast them to those that were without. Blessed be our God in all things, who hath delivered up the ungodly. Therefore, whereas we are now purposed to keep the purification of the temple, upon the five and twentieth day of the man cast loose, we thought it necessary to certify you thereof, that ye also might keep it as the feast of the tabernacles and of the fire which was given us when Nehemiah offered sacrifice after that he had built the temple and the altar. For when our fathers were led into Persia, the priests that were then devout took the fire of the altar privily and hid it in a hollow place of a pit without water, where they kept it sure, so that the place was unknown to all men. Now after many years, when it pleased God, Nehemiah, being sent from the king of Persia, did send of the posterity of those priests that had hit it to the fire. But when they told us they found no fire but thick water, they commanded he them to draw it up and to bring it. And when the sacrifices were laid on, Nehemiah commanded the priest to sprinkle the wood and the things laid thereupon with the water. When this was done, and the time came that the sun shone, which afore was hid in the cloud, there was a great fire kindled, so that every man marveled. And the priest made the prayer whilst the sacrifice was consuming. I say both the priest and all the rest, Jonathan beginning, and the rest answering thereunto as Nehemiah did. And the prayer was after this manner, O Lord, Lord God, greater of all things, who art fearful and strong and righteous and merciful and the only and gracious King. 
the only giver of all things, the only just, almighty, and everlasting, thou that delivers Israel from all trouble, and didst choose the fathers and sanctify them. Receive the sacrifice for thy whole people Israel, and preserve thine own portion, and sanctify it. Gather those together that are scattered from us. Deliver them that serve among the heathen. Look upon them that are despised and abhorred, and let the heathen know that thou art our God. Punish them that oppress us, and with pride do us wrong. Plant thy people again in thy holy place, as Moses had spoken, and the priest sang psalms of thanksgiving. Now when the sacrifice was consumed, Nehemiah commanded the water that was left to be poured on the great stones. When this was done, there was kindled a flame, but it was consumed by the light that shined from the altar. So when this matter was known, it was told the king of Persia, that in the place where the priests that were led away had hit the fire, there appeared water, and that Nehemiah had purified the sacrifices through it. Then the king, in closing the place, made it holy, after he had tried the matter. And the king took many gifts, and bestowed thereof on those whom he would gratify. And Nehemiah called this thing Naphtar, which is as much as to say a cleansing, but many men call it Nephi. 2. It is also found in the records that Jeremy the prophet commanded them that were carried away to take up the fire as it had been signified, and how that pro the prophet, having given them the law, charged them not to forget the commandments of the Lord, and that they should not err in their minds when they see images of silver and gold with their ornaments. And with other such speeches exhorted he them that the law should not depart from their hearts. It was also contained in the same writing that the prophet, being warned of God, commanded the tabernacle and the ark to go with him. As he went forth into the mountain, where Moses climbed up and saw the heritage of God. And when Jeremy came thither, he found an hollow cave, wherein he laid the tabernacle and the ark and the altar of incense, and so stopped the door. And some of those that followed him came to mark the way, but they could not find it. Which when Jeremy perceived, he blamed them, saying, As for that place, it shall be unknown until the time that God gathers his people again together and receive them unto mercy. Then shall the Lord shew them these things, and the glory of the Lord shall appear, and the cloud also, as it was shewed under Moses, as, as when Solomon desired that the place might be honorably sanctified. It was also declared that he being wise over the sacrifice of the dedication and of the finishing of the temple. And as when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifices. Even so prayed Solomon also, and the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings. And Moses said, Because the sin offering was not to be eaten, it was consumed. So Solomon kept those eight days. The same things also were reported in the writings and commentaries of Nehemiah, and how he founding a library gathered together the acts of the kings and the prophets and of David, and the epistles of the kings concerning the holy gifts. At this calling, In like manner also Judas gathered together all those things that were lost by reason of the war we had, and they remained with us. Wherefore, if ye have need thereof, send some to fetch them unto you. Whereas we then are about to celebrate the purification we have written unto you, and ye shall do well if ye keep the same days. We hope also that the God that delivered all his people and gave them all a heritage and a kingdom and a priesthood and a sanctuary 
as he promised in the law. will shortly have mercy upon us and gather us together out of every land under heaven into the holy place. For he had delivered us out of great troubles and had purified the place. Now as concerning Judas Maccabeus and his brethren and the purification of the great temple and the dedication of the altar, and the wars against Antichus, Epiphanes, and Eupator his son, and the manifest signs that came from heaven unto those that behaved themselves manfully to their honor for Judaism, so that, being by a few, they overcame the whole country and chased barbarous multitudes, and recovered again the temple renowned all the world over, and freed the city and upheld the laws which were going down, the Lord being gracious unto them with all favor. And these things, I say, being declared by Jason of Siren in five books, we will assay to a bridge in one volume. For considering the infinite number and the difficulty which they find that desire to look into the narrations of the story for the variety of the matter, we have been careful that they that will read may have delight and that they that are desirous to commit to memory might have ease, and that all into whose hands it comes might have profit. Therefore to us that have taken us upon us this painful labor of upbridging, it was not easy, but a matter of sweat and watching. Even as it is no ease unto him that prepared a banquet, and seeketh the benefit of others, yet for the pleasuring of many we will undertake gladly these great pains, leaving to the author the exact handling of every particular and laboring to follow the rules of an abridgment. For as the master builder of a new house must care for the whole building, but he that undertaketh to set it out and paint it, must seek out fit things for the adorning thereof. Even so, I think it is with us to stand upon every point and go over things at large, and to be curious in particulars belonging to the first order of the story. But to use brevity and avoid much laboring of the work is to be granted to him that will make an abridgment. Here then will we begin the story, only adding thus much to that which hath been said, that it is a foolish thing to make a long prologue and to be short in the story itself. 3. Now when the holy city was inhabited with all peace, and the laws were kept very well, because of the godliness of Onias the high priest, and his hatred of wickedness, it came to pass that even the kings themselves did honor the place and magnify the temple with their best gifts, insomuch that Salicus of Asia of his own revenues bare all the costs belonging to the service of the sacrifices, but one Simon of the tribe of Benjamin, who was made governor of the temple, fell out with the high priest about disorder in the city. And when he could not overcome Onias, he got him to Apollonius, the son of Tarasus, who then ha was governor of Celosuria and Phenice, and told him that the uh, treasury in Jerusalem was full of infinite sums of money, so that the multitude of the riches which did not pertain to the account of the sacrifices was innumerable, and that it was possible to bring all into the king's hand. Now when Apollonius came to the king and shewed him of the money whereof he was told, the king chose out of Heliodorus his treasurer and sent him with a commandment to bring him the foresaid money. So forthwith Heliodorus took his journey under a color of visiting the cities of Zelosuria and Phineas, but indeed to fulfill the king's purpose. 
And when he was come to Jerusalem and had been courteously received of the high priest of the city, he told him what intelligence was given of the money, and declared whereof he came, and asked if these things were so indeed. When the high priest told him that there was such money laid up for the relief of widows and fatherless children, and that some of it belonged to Hyrcanus, a son of Tobias, a man of great dignity, and not as the wicked Simon had misinformed, the sum whereof in all was four hundred talents of silver and two hundred of gold, and that it was altogether impossible that such wrongs should be done unto them, that had committed it to the holiness of the place and to the majesty and inviolable sanctity of the temple honored over all the world. But Heliodorus, because of the king's commandment given him, said that in any wise it must be brought into the king's treasury. So at the day which he appointed, he entered into order this matter, wherefore there was no small agony throughout the whole city, but the priests prostrating themselves before the altar and the priest's vestments called unto heaven upon him to make a law concerning things given to he kept, that he they should safely be preserved for such as had committed them to be kept. Then whoso had looked the high priest in the face, it would have wounded his heart, for his countenance and the changing of his color declared the inward agony of his mind. For the man was so compassed with fear and horror of the body, that it was manifest to them that looked upon him what sorrow he had now in his heart. Others ran flocking out of their houses to the general supplication, because the place was like to come into contempt, and the women, girt with sackcloth under their breasts, abounded in the streets, and the virgins that were kept in ran some to the gates and some to the walls, and others looked out of the windows, and all holding their hands toward heaven made supplication. Then it would have pitied the man to see the falling down of the multitude of all sorts, and the fear of the high priest being in such an agony. They then called upon the Almighty Lord to keep the things committed of trust safe and sure for those that had committed them. Nevertheless, Heliodorus executed that which was decreed. Now as he was there, present himself with his guard about the treasury, the Lord of Spirits and the Prince of all power caused a great apparition, so that all that presumed to come in with him were astonished at the power of God, and fainted and were sore afraid. For there appeared unto them a horse with a terrible rider upon him, and adorned with a very fair covering, and he ran fiercely and smote at Heliodorus with his four feet, and it seemed that he that sat upon the horse had complete harness of gold. Moreover, two other young men appeared before him, notable in strength, excellent in beauty, and comely in apparel, who stood by him on either side, and scorched him continually, and gave him many sore stripes. And Heliodorus fell suddenly unto the ground, and was compassed with great darkness. But they that were with him took him up, and put him into a litter. Thus him that Lely came with a great train, and with all his guard, into the said treasury, they carried out, being unable to help himself with his weapons, and manifestly they acknowledged the power of God. For he by the hand of God was cast down, and lay speechless without all hope of life. But they praised the Lord that had miraculously honored his own place, for the temple which a little afore was full of fear and trouble when the Almighty Lord appeared, was filled with joy and gladness. Then straightway certain of Heliodorus' friends prayed on Aeneas that he would call upon the Most High to grant him his life, who lay ready to give up the ghost. So the high priest, suspecting lest the king should misconceive that some treachery had been done to Heliodorus by the Jews, offered a sacrifice for the health of the man. Now as the high priest was making an atonement, 
The same young man in the same clothing appeared and stood beside her uterus, saying, Give Onias the high priest give great thanks, insomuch as for his sake the Lord had granted thee life. And saying that thou hast been scourged from heaven, declare to all men the mighty power of God. And when they had spoken these words, they appeared no more. So Heliodorus, after he had offered sacrifice unto the Lord, and made great vows unto him that had saved his life, and saluted Onias, returned with his host to the king. Then testified he to all men the works of the great God, which he had seen with his eyes. And when the king Heliodorus, who might be a fit man, to be sent yet once again to Jerusalem, he said, if thou hast any enemy or traitor, send him thither, and thou shalt receive him well scourged, if he escape with his life, for in that place no doubt there is an especial power of God. For he that dwelleth in heaven had his eye on that place, and defended it, and he beat beat it, and destroyed them that come to hurt it. And the things concerning Heliodorus, and the keeping of the treasury, fell out on the sword. 4. This Simon now, of whom we spake afore, having been a betrayer of the money and of his country, slandered Onias, as if he had terrified Holyodorus, and been the worker of these evils. Thus was he bold to call him a traitor that had deserved well of the city, and tendered his own nation, and was so zealous of the laws. But when their hatred went so far, that by one of Simon's faction murders were committed, Onias, seeing the danger of this contention, and that Apollonius, as being the governor of Seleucia and Phenes, did rage, and increase Simon's malice. He went to the king, not to be an accuser of his countrymen, but seeking the good of all, both public and private. For he saw that it was impossible that the state should continue quiet, and Simon leave his folly, unless the king did look thereunto. But after the death of Seleucus, when Antichus called Epiphanes, took the kingdom, Jason the brother of Onias labored underhand to be high priest, promising unto the king by intercession three hundred and threescore talents of silver, and of another revenue eighty talents. Beside this, he promised to assign an hundred and fifty more, if he might have license to set him up a place for exercise, and for the training up of youth in the fashions of the heathen, and to write them of Jerusalem by the name of Antiochians, which when the king had granted and he had gotten to his hand, the rule he forthwith brought his own nation to Greekish fashion, and the royal privileges granted of special favor to the Jews by the means of John, the father of Eupolymus, who went ambassador to Rome for amity and aid. He took away and, putting down the governments which were according to the law, he brought up new customs against the law. For he built gladly a place of exercise under the tower itself, and brought the chief young men under his subjection, and made him wear a hat. Now such was the a height of great fashions and increase of heathenish manners, through the exceeding profaneness of Jason, that ungodly wretch, and no high priest, that the priest had no courage to serve any more at the altar, but despising the temple and neglecting the sacrifices, hastened to be partakers of the unlawful allowance in the place of exercise, after the game of discus called them forth, not setting by the honors of their fathers, but liking the glory of the Grecians best of all, by reason whereof sore calamity came upon them, for they had them to be their enemies and avengers whose custom they followed so earnestly and unto whom they desired to be like in all things. For it is not a like thing to do wickedly against the laws of God, but the time following shall declare these things. Now when the game that was used every faith year was kept at Tyrus, the king being present, 
This ungracious Jason sent special messengers from Jerusalem, who were Antiochians, to carry three hundred drachms of silver to the sacrifice of Hercules, which even the bearers thereof thought it fit not to bestow upon the sacrifice, because it was not convenient, but to be reserved for other charges. This money, then, in regard to the sender, was appointed to Hercules' sacrifice, but because of the bearers thereof, it was employed to the making of galleys. Now when Apollonius, the son of Menestheus, was sent into Egypt for the coronation of King Ptolemus, beloved Metor, Antichus, understanding him not to be well affected to his affairs, provided for his own safety, whereupon he came to Joppa and from thence to Jerusalem for he was honorably received of Jason, and of the city, and was brought in with torch alight, and with great shoutings, and so afterward went with his host unto Phoenix. Three years afterward, Jason sent Menelaus, the aforesaid Simon's brother, to bear the money unto the king, and to put him in mind of certain necessary matters. But he being brought to the presence of the king, when he had magnified him for the glorious appearance of his power, got the priesthood to himself, offering more than Jason by three hundred talents of silver. So he came with the king's mandate, bringing nothing worthy, the high priesthood, but having the fury of a cruel tyrant and the rage of a savage beast. Then Jason, who had undermined his own brother, being undermined by another, was compelled to flee into the country of the Ammonites. So many laws got the principality, but as for the money that he had promised unto the king, he took no good order for it, albeit Sostratus, the ruler of the castle, required it. For unto him appertained the gathering of the customs, wherefore they were both called before the king. Now many laws left his brother Lysimachus, in his stead in the priesthood, and Sustratus left Grates, who was governor of the Cyprians. Whilst those things were undoing, they of Tarsus and Malus made insurrection, because they were given to the king's concubine, called Antichus. Then came the king in all haste to appease matters, leaving Andronicus, a man in authority, for his deputy. Now Manila, supposing that he had gotten a convenient time, stole certain vessels of gold out of the temple and gave some of them to Andronicus, and some he sold into Tyrus and the cities round about, which when Onias knew of a surety, he reproved them, and withdrew himself into a sanctuary at Daphne, the light by Antiochia. Wherefore Menelaus, taking Andronicus apart, prayed him to get Onias into his hands, who being persuaded thereunto, in coming to Onias in deceit, gave him his right hand with oaths, and though he were suspected by him, yet persuaded he him to come forth of the sanctuary, whom forthwith he shut up without regard of no justice. For the which caused not only to the Jews, but many also of other nations, took great indignation and were much grieved for the unjust murder of the man. And when the king was come again from the places about Cilicia, the Jews that were in the city and certain of the Greeks that abhorred the fact also, complained because Onias was slain without cause. Therefore Antiochus was heartily sorry and moved to pity, and wept because of the sober and modest behavior of him that was dead. And being kindled with anger, forthwith he took away Andronicus his purple, and rent off his clothes, and leading him through the whole city unto that very place where he had committed impity against Onias, there slew he the cursed murderer, thus the Lord rewarded him his punishment, as he had deserved. Now when many sacrileges had been committed in the city by Lysimachus with the consent of Menelaus, and the fruit thereof was spread abroad, the multitude gathered themselves together against Lysimachus' many vessels of gold, being already carried away. 
whereupon the common people rising and being filled with rage, the Simicus armed about three thousand men, and began first to offer violence one Aranus, being the leader, a man far gone in years, and no less in folly. They then, seeing the attempt of Lysimachus, cut some of them caught stones, some clubs, others taking handfuls of dust, that was next at hand, cast them all together upon Lysimachus and those that sat upon them. Thus many of them they were wounded, and some they struck to the ground, and all of them they forced to flee, but as for the church robber himself, him they killed because the thresh beside the treasury. Of these matters, therefore, there was an accusation laid against Menelaus. Now when the king came to Tyrus, three men that were sent from the senate pleaded the cause before him. But Menelaus, being now convicted, promised Ptolemy, the son of Dorymenes, to give him much money, if he would pacify the king toward him. Whereupon Ptolemy, taking the king aside into a certain gallery, as it were to take the air, brought him to be of another mind, insomuch that he discharged Menelaus from the accusations, who notwithstanding was cause of all the mischief, and those four men who, if they had told their cause, yea, before the Satians, should have been judged innocent, them he condemned to death. Thus they that followed the matter for the city and for the people and for the holy vessels did soon suffer unjust punishment. Wherefore even they of Tyrus, moved with hatred of that wicked deed, caused them to be honorably buried. And so through the covetousness of them that were of power, Menelaus remained still in authority, increasing in malice and being a great traitor to the citizens. 5. About the same time, Antichus prepared his second voyage into Egypt, and then it happened that through all the city, for the space almost of forty days, there were seen horsemen running in the air, in cloth of gold and armed with lances, like a band of soldiers, and troops of horsemen in array, encountering and running one against another, with shaking of shields and multitude of pikes, and throwing of swords, and casting of darts, and glittering of golden ornaments, and harness of all sorts. Wherefore, every man prayed that the apparition might turn to good. Now when there was gone forth a false rumor, as though Antichus had been dead, Jason took at the least a thousand men, and suddenly made an assault upon the city. And they that were upon the walls being put back, and the city at length taken, Menelaus fled into the castle. But Jason slew his own citizens without mercy, not considering that to get the day of them of his own nation would be a most unhappy day for him, but thinking they had been his enemies and not his countrymen, whom he conquered. Howbeit for all this he obtained not the principality, but at the last received shame for the reward of his treason, and fled again into the country of the Ammonites. In the end, therefore, he had an unhappy return, being accused before Aretas, the king of the Arabians, fleeing from city to city, pursued of all men, hated as a forsaker of the laws, and being had in abomination. As an open enemy of his country and countrymen, he was cast out into Egypt. Thus he that had driven many out of their country perished in a strange land, retiring to the Lacedaemonians, and thinking there to find secure by reason of his kindred. And he that had cast out many and buried had none to mourn for him, nor any solemn funerals at all, nor sepulture with his fathers. Now when this that was done came to the king's car, he thought that Judea had revolted, whereupon removing out of Egypt in a furious mind, he took the city by force of arms, and commanded his men of war not to spare such as they met, and to slay such as went up upon the horse houses. Thus there was killing of young and old, making away of men, women, and children, slaying of virgins, 
and in France, and they were destroyed within the space of three whole days, fourscore thousand, whereof forty thousand were slain in the conflict, and no few were sold and slain. Yet was he not content with this, but presumed to go into the most holy temple of all the world, Menelaus that traitor to the laws, and to his own country, being his guide, and taking the holy vessels with polluted hands, and with profane hands pulling down the things that were dedicated by other kings to the augmentation and glory and honor of the place, he gave them away. And so hofty was Antichus in mind, that he considered not that the Lord was angry for a while for the sins of them that dwelt in the city, and therefore his eye was not upon the place. For had they not been formerly wrapped in many sins, this man, as soon as he had come, had forthwith been scourged and put back from his presumption, as Heliodorus was, whom Seleucus the king sent to view the treasury. Nevertheless, God did not choose the people for the place's sake, but the place for the people's sake. And therefore the place itself that was partaken with them of the adversity that happened to the nation did afterward communicate in the benefits sent from the Lord, and as it was forsaken in the wrath of the Almighty, so again the great Lord being reconciled, it was set up with all glory. So when Antichus had carried out of the temple a thousand and eight hundred talents, he departed in all haste unto Antiochia, winning in his pride to make the land navigable and the sea passable by foot. Such was the haftiness of his mind. And he left governors to vex the nation at Jerusalem, Philip for his country at Phrygian, and for manners more barbarous than he that set him there, and at Gazerism, Andronicus, and besides Menelaus, who was than all the rest bearing heavy hand over the citizens, having a malicious mind against his countrymen, the Jews. He sent also that detestable ringleader, Apollonius, with an army of two and twenty thousand, commanding him to slay all those that were in their best age, and to sell the women and the younger sort, who, coming to Jerusalem and pretending peace, did forbear till the holy day of the Sabbath, when taking the Jews, keeping holy day, he commanded his men to arm themselves. And so he slew all them that were gone through the celebrating of the Sabbath, and running through the city with weapons slew great multitudes. But Judas Maccabeus, with nine others, or thereabout, withdrew himself into the wilderness, and lived in the mountains after the manner of beasts, with his company, who fed on herbs continually, lest they should be partakers of the pollution. 6. Now long after this, the king sent an old man of Athens to compel the Jews to depart from the laws of their fathers, and not to live after the laws of God, and to pollute also the temple in Jerusalem, and to call it the temple of Jupiter Olympus, and that in garrison of Jupiter, the f defender of strangers, as they did desire to dwell in the place. The coming in of this mischief was sore and grievous to the people, for the temple was filled with riot and reveling by the Gentiles, who dallied with harlots and had to do with women within the circuit of the holy places, and besides that brought in things that were not lawful. The altar also was filled with profane things which the law forbidden. Neither was it lawful for a man to keep Sabbath days, or ancient fast, or to profess himself at all to be a Jew. And in the day of the king's birth, every month they were brought by bitter constraint to eat of the sacrifices, and when the fast of Jews was kept, the Jews were compelled to go in procession the batches carrying ivy. Moreover, there went out a decree to the neighbor cities of the Eton by the suggestion of Ptolemy against the Jews that they should observe the same fashions and be partakers of their sacrifices, and whoso would not conform themselves to the manners of the Gentiles, 
should be put to death. Then might a man have seen the present misery. For there were two women brought who had circumcised their children, whom when they had openly led round about the city, the babes handing at their breasts, they cast them down headlong from the wall, and others that had run together into caves nearby to keep the Sabbath day secretly, being discovered by Philip, were all burnt together, because they made a conscience to help themselves for the honor of the most sacred day. Now I beseech those that read this book, that they be not discouraged for these calamities, but that they judge those punishments not to be for destruction, but for a chastening of our nation. For it is a token of His great goodness, when wicked doers are not suffered any long time, but forthwith punished. For not as with other nations whom the Lord patiently forbear to punish till they be come to the fullness of their sins, so till it he with us, lest thou being come to the height of sin, afterwards he should take vengeance of us, and therefore he never withdraweth his mercy from us, and till he punish with adversity, yet that he never forsake his people. But let this that we had spoken be for warning unto us, and now will we come to the declaring of the matter in a few words. Eleazar, one of the principal scribes, an aged man, and of a well-favored countenance, was constrained to be open his mouth and to eat swine's flesh, by he choosing rather to die gloriously than to live stained with such an abomination, spirit forth and came of his own accord to the torment. As it beheld them to come, they are resolute to stand out against such things as are not lawful for love of life to be tasted. But they that had the charge of the wicked beast, for the old acquaintance they had with the man, taking him aside, besought him to bring flesh of his own provision, such as was lawful for him to use, and make as if he did eat of the flesh taken from the sacrifice commanded by the king, that in so doing he might be delivered from death, and for the old friendship with them find favor. But he began to consider discreetly, and as became his age and excellency of his ancient years, and the honor of his gray head whereon was come, and his most honest education from a child, or rather the holy law made and given by God, Therefore he answered accordingly, and willed them straightways to send him to the grave. For he become a not a rage, said he, in any wise to dissemble, whereby many young persons might think that Eleazar, being fourscore years old and ten, were now gone to a strange religion. And so they threw mine hypocrisy and desired to live a little time and a moment longer, should be deceived by me, and I get the state to mine old age, and make it abominable. For though for the present time I should be delivered from the punishment of men, yet should I not escape the hand of the Almighty, neither alive nor dead. Wherefore now, manfully changing this life, I will shew myself such a one as mine age required, and leave a notab notable example to such as be young, to die willingly and courageously for the honorable and holy laws. And when he had said these words, immediately he went to the torment. They that led him, changing the good, will they bear him a little before into hatred, because the foresaid speeches proceeded, as they thought, from a desperate mind. But when he was ready to die with stripes, he groaned and said, it is manifest unto the Lord that the holy knowledge, that whereas I might have been delivered from death, I now endure sore pains in body by being beaten. But in soul I am well content to suffer these things, because I fear him. And as this man died, leaving his death for an example of a noble courage and a memorial of virtue, not only unto young men, but unto all his nation. 7. 
It came to pass also that seven brethren with their mother were taken and compelled by the king against the law to taste swine's flesh and were tormented with scourges and whips. But one of them that spake first said thus, What wouldest thou ask or learn of us? We are ready to die rather than to transgress the laws of our fathers. Then the king, being enraged, commanded pans and cauldrons to be made hot, which forthwith being heated, he commanded to cut out the tongue of him that spake first, and to cut off the utmost parts of his body, the rest of his brethren and his mother looking on. Now when he was thus maimed in all his members, he commanded him being yet alive to be brought to the fire and to be fried in the pan. And as the vapor of the pan was for a good space dispersed, they exhorted one another with the mother to die manfully, saying thus, The Lord God, look it upon us, and in truth had comfort in us, as Moses in a song which witnessed to their faces declared, saying, And he shall be comforted in his servants. So when the first was dead after this number, they brought the second to make him a mocking stock, and when they had pulled off the skin of his head with the hair, they asked him, Wilt thou eat before thou be punished throughout every member of thy body? But he answered in his own language and said, No, wherefore he also received the tor next torment in order as the former did. And when he was at the last gasp, he said, Thou, like a fury, takest us out of this present life, but the king of the world shall raise us up, who have died for his loss unto everlasting life. After him was the third made a mocking stock, and when he was required, he put out his tongue and a right soon, holding forth his hands manfully, and said courageously, This I had from heaven, and for his loss I despised them, and from him I hoped to receive them again. And so much that the king and they that were with him marveled at the young man's courage, for that he nothing regarded the pains. Now when this man was dead also, they tormented and mangled the fort in like manner. So when he was ready to die, he said thus, It is good being put to death by men to look for hope from God, to be raised up again by him. As for thee, thou shalt have no resurrection to life. Afterward they brought the fifth also and mangled him. They looked unto he unto the king and said, Thou hast power over men, thou art corruptible, thou dost what thou wilt, yet think not that our nation is forsaken of God. But abide a while and behold his great power, how he will torment thee and thy seed. After him also they brought the six, who being ready to die said, be not deceived without cause, for we suffer these things for ourselves, having sinned against our God. Therefore marvelous things are done unto us. We think not thou to take us in thine hand to strive against God, that thou shalt escape unpunished. But the mother was marvelous above all, and worthy of honorable memory. For when she saw her seven sons slain within the space of one day, she bare with a good courage, because of the hope that she had in the Lord. Yea, she exhorted every one of them in her own language, filled with courageous spirits, and stirring up her womanish thoughts with a manly stomach, she said unto them, I cannot tell how you came into my womb, for I neither gave you breath nor life, neither was it I that formed the members of every one of you. But doubtless the creator of the world who from the generation of man and found out the beginning of all things will also of his own mercy give you breath and life again, as ye now regard not your own selves for his law's sake. Now Antichus, thinking himself despised, and suspecting it to be a reproachful speech, whilst the youngest was yet alive, did not only exhort him by the words, but also assured him with oaths that he would make him both a rich and a happy man, if he would turn from the laws of his fathers, and that also he would take him for his friend, and trust him with affairs. But when the young man would in no case hearken unto him, the king called his mother, and exhorted her that she would counsel the young man to save his life. And when he had exhorted her, 
with many words, she promised him that she would console her son. But she, bowing herself toward him, laughing the cruel tyrant to scorn, spake in her country language on this manner, O oh, my son, have pity upon me that bear thee nine months in my womb, and gave thee such three years, and nourished thee, and brought thee up unto this age, and endured the troubles of education. I beseech thee, my son, look upon the heaven and the earth, and all that is therein, and consider that God made them of things that were not, and so was mankind made likewise. Fear not this tormentor, but being worthy of thy brethren, take thy death, that I may receive thee again in mercy with thy brethren. While she was yet speaking these words, the young man said, Whom wait ye for? I will not obey the king's commandment, but I will obey the commandment of the law that was given unto our fathers by Moses. And thou that hast been the author of all mischief against the Hebrews shalt not escape the hands of God, for we suffer because of our sins. And though the living Lord be angry with us a little while for our chastening and correction, yet shall he be at one again with his servants. But thou, o godless man, and of all other most wicked, be not lifted up without a cause, nor puffed up with uncertain hopes, lifting up thy hand against the servants of God. For thou hast not yet escaped the judgment of Almighty God, who seeth all things. For brethren, who now have suffered a short pain, are dead under God's covenant of everlasting life. But thou, through the judgment of God, shalt receive just punishment for thy pride. But I, as my brethren, offer up my body and life for the loss of our fathers, beseeching God that he would speedily be merciful unto our nation, and that thou by torments and plagues mayest confess that he alone is God, and that in me and my brethren the wrath of the Almighty, which is justly brought upon our nation, may cease. Then the king, being in a rage, handed him worse than all the rest, and took it grievously that he was mocked. So this man died undefiled and put his whole trust in the Lord. Last of all, after the sons, the mother died. Let this be enough now to have spoken concerning the idolatrous feasts and the extreme tortures.